When you were a kid, do you ever remember picking up a game, booting it up, and seeing the logos of those involved in the game's development, and just from the logo, get a good feeling about a game? Maybe this was just me, but as a kid, with my pocket money, I'd go to the local EB Games, sort through the PS2 games, and just pick something that looked cool, not knowing who made it, or really even what to expect. This brings me to Pandemic Studios. Some of my childhood favourites began with this logo, like Star Wars Battlefront, Destroy All Humans, and Mercenaries. Again, back then I had no idea who made games, but every time I'd see Pandemic's logo, I would just get a good feeling that I made the right choice with the game I'd chosen to pick up. This mindset and general good feeling has stayed with me all the way up to this point in regards to Pandemic's games, because I associate the studio with fun games. However, whilst I have fond memories of playing Star Wars Battlefront, Destroy All Humans, Mercenaries, and The Lord of the Rings Conquest, one of Pandemic's games that I don't really have any specific memories towards, yet remember sitting down and playing, is the saboteur. From my vague memory of the game, the saboteur took elements from Assassin's Creed and Grand Theft Auto, but uniquely set the game during World War II and featured a monochromatic color palette that through your actions in game allowed you to restore color to this bleak world by exploding as much as possible. This vague memory was enough for me to have nostalgic feelings towards the saboteur, but a couple of weeks ago, before I decided to revisit the game, if you were to ask me any specifics into the story and gameplay, I wouldn't have been able to tell you why I enjoyed the game almost 11 years ago. Yeah, 11 years is a long time, and you're asking for a 12 year old's opinion at that point. So I thought it was time to update my opinions with a now adult brain. And well, here we are. Here is my retrospective on The Saboteur. When researching The Saboteur's development, a prominent theme arose very quickly. There isn't a lot of information about the development process itself, but instead the closure of Pandemic. All I could really find out about the game's development was areas cut from the game late in development. But even that feels like it connects to Pandemic being shut down. So let's talk Pandemic Studios before and after EA, because the saboteur is obviously so connected to the studio's closure. Pandemic Studios was established in 1998 by former Activision employees Josh Resnick and Andrew Goldman. Whilst Goldman and Resnick were leaving Activision, a working relationship was immediately forged as Activision invested $10 million into Pandemic for 5% of the company and gave Pandemic the licenses for both Battlezone and Dark Reign. Sequels to these two licenses would be Pandemic's first games, which makes sense considering that the employees at Pandemic, at its inception, had worked on the originals. Pandemic went on to release Triple Play 2002, Army Men RTS, and Star Wars The Clone Wars to some success, but it wasn't until 2004 where the studio would find both critical and financial success. Full Spectrum Warrior was a winner of numerous awards such as Best Original Game and Best Simulation Game and was developed through the military's interest in training through video games. The game that catapulted Pandemic to household name status and where many, including myself, first experienced Pandemic's work was the original Star Wars Battlefront, which I'm sure will be another retrospective at some point. Star Wars Battlefront was a hit, not just critically, but financially. Pandemic had another big year right after it though, as 2005 saw the release of Mercenaries, Destroy All Humans, and Star Wars Battlefront 2. It was as if the company could do no wrong, until they did. 
Pandemic success from 2004 and 2005 led to Pandemic merging with BioWare in late 2005 in an effort to pull resources together and help them stop rushing out their games, which is understandable after you just released three games within the span of a year. This move would end up leading to Bioware and Pandemic being acquired by EA though. And this is where the story goes downhill. Pandemic's first release under EA was Mercenaries 2, garnering generally unfavorable reviews and the studio backed that up with Lord of the Rings Conquest, which again wasn't the success critically and commercially that Pandemic or EA were after. Both games I remember enjoying though, I will say that. Not only was Pandemic's reputation slipping in the eyes of the consumers though, but through developing a movie tie-in game for The Dark Knight, failing to meet the deadline for the movie, and the game being cancelled by EA, would lose the company an estimate of $100 million. This loss prompted EA to close Pandemic Studio in Brisbane, Australia shortly after. The writing was on the wall for Pandemic, but they did have one final hope, and that was the saboteur. The saboteur excited those around Pandemic as the idea sprung from Andrew Goldman reading a book about the life of William Grover Williams. William was a Grand Prix racing driver, but during the Second World War and the invasion of France, fled to England where he was recruited into the Special Operations Executive to foster the French resistance. An incredibly unique story that had never been seen before in gaming and allowed Pandemic to do something different in what was by that point a tired first person shooter destination. Unfortunately as much as they'd hoped the saboteur would save them, EA would end up closing Pandemic only a month before the game would release, leaving a skeleton crew to complete the game. The Saboteur would end up being Pandemic's final game, a sad end to a once legendary studio in my eyes, and another fallen company to EA. The Saboteur is set in the year 1940 and begins with this video getting demonetized as we are introduced to our protagonist, Sean Devlin. We see Sean drinking alone as he glares at a burnt picture before his alone time is interrupted by a man named Luke. Luke sees Sean's anger towards the Nazis and offers him a way to act on this, leading us to help him destroy a Nazi fueling station where we are introduced to the basic gameplay mechanics that I'll go over in that section of the video. Once we're done destroying the fuel depot though, we go back a couple of months to a flashback. It's in this flashback we learn the backstory for Sean's hatred for the Nazis, if he needed one. Sean was a race car mechanic about to race in the 1940 Grand Prix as we arrive in town with mentor Vittore, best friend Jules, who was the man we saw briefly in the photo, so probably not a good sign, and Jules sister Veronique. Rival racer Kurt Dierke, the favourite to win the Grand Prix, cheats in the race as Sean passes him and in retaliation shoots out one of Sean's tyres. This enrages Sean and so in an act to seek vengeance, Sean and Jules head to what they believe is just an automotive factory where Dierke works and sabotage his car. This results in Sean and Jules being captured and tortured by Jurka, who we find out is a Nazi SS commander. Jurka tortures and then executes Jules in front of Sean before Sean manages to escape the factory, only to witness the German invasion of France. Really that's all you need to know in regards to the story for the saboteur. Jurka killed your best friend, he must die. But to get to him, Sean reluctantly realizes he needs to help the French resistance fight the Nazi invasion. The story progresses further obviously and sees more characters die in Sean's pursuit of revenge. But I'll be honest, it just isn't all that interesting for me. 
Again, it's a story of Sean seeking revenge. It's not complex, and you could make an argument that it's not to be taken seriously. And that's what I initially thought. I loved my time with the prologue, for instance, because the tone was what I remembered from the saboteur. It doesn't take itself too seriously. There are some genuinely funny moments, and sets up an intriguing character in Sean. Does Sean sound like an Irishman? But if you're keen to get your teeth kicked in, I'd be happy to oblige. Not from my experience talking to my family in Belfast, but again, initially it presents a story that isn't to be taken seriously. And you sort of get into a mindset that it's a silly story, have fun with it. Unfortunately, the story very quickly drops the humour, and the further along you get, the more serious the story becomes until it gets to a point where I felt the game had lost that fun aspect. Why I have a problem with this is because issues in the story almost aren't as relevant if it's a goofy story. But it's when the game tries to have serious moments or make you feel a certain emotion where nitpicks become complaints. Issues like cheesy dialogue, bad accents, Characters that through the cheesy dialogue and bad accents, you just never feel compelled to care about. And it all builds up to characters dying and getting just who cares death scenes, followed by the physics of the game breaking. Go, take the others and seal the passage behind you. Do this. Compassion is a luxury we can no longer afford. The enemy we face has none. To be fair, I may have parked too closely to the objective, and because most cutscenes are in engine, it resulted in a genuine laugh. It's just moments like these where I question why they try to have emotions in the game at all. The saboteur's strength is fun. It's a goofy game. Why try and make serious plot points? Maybe because it's set in World War II? But the time period is a backdrop and more relevant to the gameplay because Sean doesn't care about stopping the Nazis. He cares about killing Jerka. Apparently. I say apparently because the first chance he has to kill him, because Jerka parachutes away, he sort of just lets him escape. Why not shoot the parachute or shoot at him and try and kill him then and there? Who knows? The reason the story's failures are such a problem for me is because your enjoyment of the game will essentially boil down to how long can you blow up Nazis for? I'll dive into this more in the gameplay portion of the video, but towards the end of my time with the saboteur, I just wanted to finish the story. Not because I was enjoying the story more than the gameplay, I just had my feel with the gameplay loop, and for the purposes of making this video, I was ready for the game to be over. Again though, I think Sean is a fun protagonist, and when the story carries a silly, over-the-top tone that matches the gameplay, it's a lot of fun. There just wasn't enough of it here. Despite my issues with the Saboteur's story though, the game is a lot of fun to play. The gameplay is where the saboteur really does feel like it's having fun with its premise. You're a part of the French resistance pushing back against the Nazis, so go do that whilst causing as much chaos as you possibly can, and free Paris of its Nazi occupation. This is where by far the most intriguing element comes into play, which is the visuals. Usually in my retrospectives, I don't cover a game's visuals because, well, I'm not revisiting a game because I think visually it's going to hold up in today's market. The saboteur's visuals, however, are tied to the gameplay. I'm sure you may have noticed if maybe you were unfamiliar with this game, that this world is engulfed in a monochromatic color palette. And only once you complete certain actions does color become reintroduced into that area. There is a lot to like about this design choice. When you enter a monochromatic area, you immediately feel the Nazis' presence, the lack of hope, 
and the highlights of red drawing your eyes to soldiers or the abundance of flags. You really feel like you're in danger and gives you the urge to be as stealthy as possible to avoid the many eyes. It's not all doom and gloom in these areas though. As I mentioned, the red is highlighted. And in this Paris, there are plenty of explosive barrels. Like hundreds. I don't know who put all these explosive hazards around, but it's a lot. And with all these explosives is how we'll restore color to this dark world. In order to restore color to an area, you'll need to cause some chaos in a predetermined location. There isn't any need to 100% an area. These will usually be a result of the game's missions, both main and side. You never really know when to expect the explosion of colour, as it can happen through destroying a fortress to stopping an unwanted marriage. But it depends on what is causing that area the most depression, I guess. It could be a facility like the fueling station, or a massive anti-air gun, to a Nazi with too much power, and through dialogue you'll quickly learn what to expect from an area. The saboteur does a great job at making you feel like you really did something when you see these explosions of colour, and driving around a newly coloured area after experiencing so much black and white just feels good and refreshing. So now that the colour portion is explained, let's talk about the gameplay mechanics. The saboteur takes on a third person perspective in an open world. Sean has access to a good amount of weapons, but can only carry two at a time, along with two different explosives. You have hand to hand combat as well, but I never really used it. You can get from point to point by either driving or parkouring, and you can approach a given situation through stealth and using disguises, or just go guns blazing. Along the journey through completing various tasks, you'll unlock perks that increase Sean's abilities, and you have a black market where you use the game's currency, contraband which you acquire from disrupting the Nazis, to purchase guns, explosives, maps and upgrades for ammo and your cars. But really all you need to know is, you have dynamite. All of these gameplay mechanics just revolve around how you blow things up. All this mayhem doesn't go unnoticed though, and no matter how many Nazis you get rid of, you'll eventually have to retreat. If you try and escape on foot, you'll be able to hide in various locations that sometimes make no sense, like this shed right next to an objective that I just destroyed. If you're in a vehicle though, you'll need to exit the alarm range without being spotted. This is initially quite challenging and can take you a while to get rid of enemies on your tail. But once you learn the map a little more, you can notice how the alarm disappears very quickly once you're outside of the zone, and you can exploit this. The missions do have a decent amount of variety, from again, stopping a wedding, finding a general amongst his body doubles, driving a brainwashed Nazi to his base as a suicide bomber, or completing a couple of races. But mostly, you're probably going to have to blow something up. The open world is fun to drive around and go from mission to mission, until you get one mission on one side of the map, and the next one is on the opposite side. But along the way to these missions, you'll probably also be tempted to blow something up. I'm sure you've gathered this by now, but I cannot stress this enough. You'll be destroying as much as you possibly can, or at least feel like. I know the saboteur gets compared to Grand Theft Auto and Assassin's Creed a lot. I mean, they could have hid that fact a little better. But I'll be honest, if you're going to compare it to anything, the best one is Red Faction Guerrilla. Both take a third person perspective, have solid driving controls, alright gunplay, and heavy amounts of destruction, the only real difference is the parkour and the fact one is set on Mars and the other in World War II. If you enjoy Red Faction Guerrilla's gameplay loop, you'll enjoy yourself in the saboteur, but the gameplay does have its faults. 
The driving controls are solid, and the gunplay, whilst nothing special, gets the job done well enough. The stealth is my biggest issue in regards to the gameplay though, which is a shame since we're supposed to be sabotaging things and not a mercenary. I very rarely entertained the stealth options because the areas don't feel equipped for it to be practical. Even whilst disguised, you'll be caught incredibly quickly if you get too close to any Nazi, so you need to walk really slow to minimise your suspicion. Not too bad an idea, but when you have tight hallways, stairwells and just too many enemies, it just doesn't work. I think disguising makes sense. The enemies are certainly alert, unless you raise the alarm, that's when they don't seem so smart. And the stealth can work in the right arena for it, and feels great to sneak around, blowing things up and confusing the hell out of the enemies. It just is all too rare it all comes together. Parkouring is another issue for one reason. Why are these pipes so finicky? These issues though lead me to my experience playing the game on PC. The Saboteur's PC port is a little rough in the beginning. The first thing I noticed was the controller spazzing out. The tutorial showed keyboard prompts. When trying to drive, the accelerate and camera controls were tied together for some reason. And the menus... I don't know how to describe it. Googling this issue, I found out that you need to plug the controller in when you actually control Sean, and these issues went away. Back in business. Awesome, right? Not quite. After completing the prologue just fine is when I started getting constant crashes, and not crashing to desktop, but needing to restart your PC crashes. This issue did make me go into the files, but still nothing. I found another fix for Nvidia drivers that for some reason worked a charm for the saboteur, and this finally fixed the crashing. Yes, the PC port is a pain, but since the game isn't backwards compatible yet, and finding a copy isn't easy for 360 or PS3, it's the most available option. Were these issues a dampener initially? Of course. Going through game files and finding the code that's causing problems is never fun. But for the most part after this, the game ran well. No controller issues, didn't crash again, but because of these issues, if you do have a console version, maybe avoid the headache. Gameplay wise, the saboteur is just a good time. I'm a sucker for World War II and some Nazi killing fun. And because it is like nothing else in this era, it was a great breath of fresh air. What I will say though is, you can become burnt out if you play in longer sessions, and you really need to be in a fun mood whilst playing because if you lose that, all the game's issues will become incredibly apparent. The Saboteur is a tricky game to cover in a breakdown format. You can pick this game apart very easily if you so choose. For me though, when I was writing this retrospective, all I needed to remember was the amount of fun I had playing the game. Yes, the story is largely uninteresting. The stealth and parkour has its share of problems. And playing on PC initially made me question if the game was worth covering. However, running or driving around Nazi-occupied Paris, going between monochromatic and colourful locales, and just blowing the ever-loving shit out of as much as you want is a lot of fun. If you're a fan of Red Faction Guerrilla, or the Just Cause series, and you want that sort of chaos in a fresh, historic setting, and can put up with the game's flaws, then yeah, I highly recommend if you haven't already, go and play The Saboteur. Does it hold up today? For fun value, absolutely. But I'd love to see this concept attempted again today, because there is something really special about this game that can be done better. But right now, this is all we have, and it's one of those games I define as a genuine good time.